Welcome everybody. We'll go to you. We'll start in a second. In a second. <clears throat> For those that are just joining us, uh, welcome. We'll go and get started in one second. We're going to wait for everybody to kind of jump in the call. And for those that don't know me, my name is Brad Conrad, and you are about to join the class of 2020 SPS virtual uh, senior send off. I see a couple more people popping in. I'm so excited. This is the most excited I've been all day. Okay, do we want to go ahead and get started, everybody? Okay, so I'll go ahead and, I'll go ahead and start my remarks. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Brad Conrad. I'm the director of the Society of Physics Students and Sigma Pi Sigma. So um, uh, from me uh, and from all of the SPS National Office, I just wanted to say congratulations to the class of 2020. Um, you have done a great job, and the most important thing is you did it. You made it. Congratulations. It's not easy getting a physics degree. I mean, it's really, really not easy getting a physics degree. Um, all the late nights, all the quantum mechanics, homework sets, uh, coffee, tea, staying up late, um, not doing some things that you really wanted to do to make sure the homework sets were done. These are tough things. Um, so what I wanted to do is just offer my own personal words of wisdom to you just for a second. Um, I just wanna say that I'm very proud of everything that you've accomplished and you should be proud too. These are extraordinary times, but that doesn't take away from the extraordinary, extraordinary nature of what you did. Congratulations on graduating. Um, the second thing is that you really should remember your friends, your professors, and your colleagues. They're going to be lifelong friends, and they're people you really need to stay in touch with. So reach back to the people that helped you get to where you are today, uh, and make sure that you're talking to faculty and friends and all those people uh, wherever life may take you. And then... Um, Despite everything that's going on, you have been given the tools and you have the tools today as you're graduating to solve all of the problems that the world has. So we do what we can, when we can, for those we can. And I know you're going to do a great job. And so we have somebody special that recorded a remark for us. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Maloney. Um, Dr. Michael Maloney is the CEO of the American Institute of Physics. He's the ninth CEO. Um, uh, he's worked a long time. Uh, he was a previous director for the Space and Aeronautics at the U.S. National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, and I'll let him speak for himself. Congratulations, SPSers, on graduating. What an exciting time, notwithstanding the weirdness that is the COVID-19 pandemic and all the disruption that it has brought to your and our lives. Uh, let's take a moment to really celebrate your remarkable achievements as graduates. Um, this past year was highlighted by my attending the SPS FizCon, which was such a fantastic event, and I enjoyed meeting so many of you there. I would much prefer to be there rather than here working at home, like all of us have been over the last 10 weeks at AIP. And certainly we have seen a lot of disruption, but as you start out on your careers, um, having graduated from college, uh, just stay in mind that uh, this is also a time to be very hopeful. Disruption leads to innovation, and certainly our lives have become very disrupted over the last three months. But I'm remarkably optimistic that this disruption will have long-lasting positive impacts on the way we do, we carry out our lives, how we look after our environment, how we do our work, and how we interact uh, socially and professionally with others. So congratulations. Um, thank you so much for all that you've done for SPS and AIP during your time at university. And we certainly look forward to keeping in touch with you in the years ahead. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, Michael wishes he could be here, but he couldn't make it in person. Um, and the, one of the highlights of today, in fact, the highlight today is I'm very happy and proud to introduce Julianne Pollard-Larkin. Uh, she is originally from Miami, Florida, 
She was a double major in physics and mathematics at the University of Miami, where she got her uh, bachelor's of science degree. And then she got her PhD from UCLA in biomedical physics. And she is currently an associate professor of medical physics at University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, which is one of the preeminent spots to do such work in the US. Um, and I'm extremely excited to uh, announce that she'll be one of the plenary speakers and one of our guests of honor at the 2021 Physics Congress. So um, virtual, virtual clapping and congratulations and uh, we'd love to hear what you have to tell all the people graduating today. Thank you for joining us. All right, does everyone hear me just fine? We sure do. Excellent. I want to first and foremost thank everyone who had any part in actually selecting me, Brad Conrad, Kayla Stevens, everyone who helped put to this put this together, and all the people behind the scenes that I know have worked so hard on this. I want you to know that I appreciate getting this time to talk to you guys because believe it or not, roughly about a decade ago, I was sitting in the same spot as you all. Of course, there wasn't any COVID at that time, but I don't want to spend all the time talking about COVID. I want us to actually start to discuss what your future is, and believe it or not, it's bigger than that. So now let's see if we can share the screen. <laughs> Let's see, and make sure that you also can grow from this and get some pointers on how to successfully move forward. So the hope of this talk is that you look beyond your current situation and develop a skill set and a growth mindset that will propel you forward and not lead you to believe that this is the end of the road, because believe it or not, this is just the beginning, and it's still a time to be excited. So the title of this talk is Nothing is More Contagious Than Hope, Tips for a Physics Student Braving a Pandemic. Now, where did I get this quote from? Nothing is more contagious than hope. How many of you guys have ever heard of um, William McCraven? He was our former chancellor for the UT system down here, and he was also first and foremostly known as the actual military leader who helped to identify and strategically take out um, Osama bin Laden. So he is the man that wrote up a couple of very interesting articles, and one of the last ones that he has written about um, two months ago was to let us know that despite all of the tragedies that we have gone through during this corona pandemic, there is still something to hold on to. And the fact that even as we deal with this virus, we must never forget that nothing is more contagious than hope. And so I want to remember and celebrate you in this moment. Congratulations. Wear your caps and gowns. Get excited. I want you to revel in it, even if you can't revel together more than six feet of each other. <laughs> All right? So even though you can't get more than two meters apart, I want you to celebrate the heck out of this. You have accomplished something so great that most people, I would actually say, what is it, 95% of other kids are in other specialties. So you are special. And I just want you to know, thank you for joining the team. I salute you. So the tips, I'm going to give it to you straight and simple. I want you to know these things and have a whole good understanding of it before you step forward towards your next goal. I want you to know yourself. This is important. I want you to be selfish. This is something that most, uh, most mentors won't say, especially not an associate professor. Um, be selfish about your well-being. Be a mentor and grab an advocate now. And I, I almost mean actually touch. <laughs> you need one. Fail forward, or at least differently. Don't feel the same way twice. Speak up for yourself. This is something that notoriously graduate students will not do, no matter what. Have a growth mindset instead of a mindset that feels that if you are not talented, you cannot achieve something, that everyone else was born with this skill and somehow you're lacking. Have a growth mindset and a belief in yourself that anything can be learned. And then finally, I need you to take this really to heart. Like, L-I-K-E, it is not a requirement of anyone that you interact with, but respect. Treating you with that respect as a human being, that is. And that's gonna help get you through so much. Don't expect everyone to like you, it's not necessary. 
Please believe there's lots of people that don't like me, probably within earshot right now, but I'm still here and I'm still chief. So let's talk about when your best day in your life will be. This was a great day. This is me, um, pre-COVID, as you can see, with hair that I lovingly buy each month. I'm not any longer. <laughs> and so on this day, I believe society tells women and even young people, this is it for you. This is great. This is the hallmark of how good it gets. And I want you to understand the beautiful hands that you see in the corners of this image. They represent my family members and the man to my right. That's my husband. I was so excited. But was this the best moment in my life? I had to think about that. Next, oh my God, hello, look at here. This is the culmination of a wonderful relationship. Little one on the way. I felt good, I was giving my moment. I was feeling myself, extra hair. You know, my mood goes up with the amount of hair on my head. I was really excited, but was that the best moment? Or would it have been this, when this person came bursting out of me? I want you to understand, each of these moments are great, and there is something that you learn about yourself in all of them. But I'll let you know, when you have those moments of self-revelation that requires you to dig inward, that's, to me, was some of my best days. So I can't say that any one of these was the best, but I remember my first best day, and it was none of those. Ooh, get ready for when I tell you what that day was. And you'll see for yourself which turns out to be true for yourself. So let's start from the beginning, because I said know yourself, right? So I need you to know me. I'm gonna tell you my story. The point of knowing yourself fully is that you need to evaluate your particular um, foundation of all of your ethics, all of the things that help you to make your decisions and your choices so that you can then better frame your outlook. And that helps you achieve bigger goals once you have a better understanding and of your limitations and of all of your talents. So in the very beginning, this was me. This is me circa 1980 around Christmas. Very cute, just like the kid that I had. And I was born on an army base in Georgia, in Fort Bragg, Augusta, Georgia. Straight from there, I was shipped off to Pemerson, Germany with my father who was a colonel in the military. And I want you to understand, growing up as an army brat, every place was my home. I developed a quick sense of being able to adapt, which is very important in radiation therapy if anyone's aware of the field. And so all of these little movements across the East Coast of America, through Germany, I got to then get into school systems such as this one, where I am not the young black child standing there, uh, you know, patriotically holding her heart, but I was there the year before this picture was taken, and this was my school, the Department of Defense School within Germany, where you were with other children who are either European or who are also expatriates from America who are all thrust together learning four different languages so that we could all interact with one another and learning from all different kinds of instructors. It was a very interesting period of time. I was the smartest I could ever imagine being, way smarter than I am now. We were a patriotic bunch and we loved learning about all the different cultures that existed in that strange little Western European area, which was actually at the junction of Germany, France, and, um, and Switzerland. So within the school system, most of the kids were almost from the military and army brats. And so we got to have experiences where our fathers or mothers, whoever was the military personnel, would come in and make you king or queen for the day. I developed a strong sense for understanding what that leadership structure was and an appreciation for it and also an interest and a desire. All of these things were foundational elements that are put into me before I even turned five years old. But lo and behold, I finally got to be in my Latin roots. Bienvenido a Miami. I was happy. All of a sudden, after 1987, daddy said, we got to go. He wanted to be closer to his family back on the East Coast of Florida. And so we came back to Miami. And this became my new place that I became home to me. And I still beckon to Miami. Whenever I, you ask me about home, Miami, even though I didn't live there my whole life, will always be home to me. That beautiful tropic paradise where they were at that time, because I'm that old, they were actually filming Miami Vice when we moved in on that street at that particular condo unit. And so I grew up with an appreciation of all the wonderful clothing and the fashion and just the pace of life and just the um, expansiveness of an 80s kid. If you know 80s people, we're a little different. We're more hopeful, we're more happy, all right? And so I went to schools within Miami. This was my favorite one, Dwellers C. Good as an elementary school where you were invested 
Uh, the education was invested into primarily underrepresented students. In Miami, if you've never been to it, it's almost, I would say, 60 to 70 percent Latino. And then it's going to be about roughly 25 percent African American, as well as Caribbean, Jamaican, and so forth. And then you have about 10 to 15 percent um, Caucasian individuals, and everyone else is thrown in the mix. But it's a heavily, differently skewed environment than what I was in when I was in Germany and all those other places in Georgia on up. So I finally in Miami developed a sense for how you maintain your, your, um, your culture and you celebrate it and you also learn from the other environment around you and you appreciate the different textures and the different backgrounds of all that make up the mosaic of who you really are within that city and that community. If you've never been to South Florida, please, when um, the COVID is over, get on down there. And then who are my parents? I spoke a lot about my father, my mom. She was the best business education teacher that you could ever imagine having back circa the 1990s. She taught what is called midnight typing. She made the name up herself because she was that bad, where she would cut off the lights and yell at these children who are from underserved communities that everyone thought couldn't do anything and tell them what to type and they would type it at a rate of about 60 words per minute. Children who no one thought could do anything. She won awards for this. That was my mom. And also you can imagine she was also a very loud and proud woman who told me who I was as an African-American woman within this country and especially within that particular environment. And so I grew up full of knowledge of all the possibilities of what I could be, as well as the experiences of people who came from either Europe or from Latin America and everything was all around me and everything seemed good. And I felt that anything was potentially possible for me. So when I came to this point in my life where I was a precocious eight years old little kid, notice there I am sitting as a third person from the left next to my mom directly and my father. There is a young, handsome little cadet sitting there to my left hand side. And although I was eight years old, I want you to understand very clearly, I thought he was my full date. He was the senior army captain for that particular GROTC unit. And my dad said we were gonna help drop him off. But by the end of the night, he was with me and not his high school sweetheart. That's the type of aggressive nature that was instilled in me by being raised by people who told me, you're a star, you can do anything you want. So I was a happy, precocious, open-minded child raised by people who were leaders and shakers in their fields. Leaders such as my father, who was a lieutenant colonel in Germany, and my mom, who was the a leading um, business teacher in Miami. And so I was chubby, precocious, and happy. I didn't know exactly where to put my talents, but it was evident that I was very persuasive just by looking at that smile of that young man, 17 years old, who couldn't leave his happy little eight-year-old um, senior army instructor's daughter alone just so because of her charms. I want you to understand, I've been persuasive since I popped out of the womb. And so this little nerdy chocolate child developed a passion for anything she set her mind on. And I developed an interest in all subjects, but then I started to frame things towards science as I got into middle school, which is the era that I was in in this photo shown here. Everything changed. You literally heard the real stuff within my life when I saw this image of this wonderful woman. I don't know how many of you guys, because of your age group, would know her name off the top of your head, but this is the one, the only, Dr. Mae Jemison, the first African-American woman to ever go into space. She broke, uh, ladies, you know we have a glass ceiling? She for said, forget that. She went out of our actual orbit. This woman made it clear to me that there is nothing on this earth or outside of this earth that you can't do with your chocolate little self. So it was with this knowledge, seeing this image, that if she can do this, there is no limit on myself that propelled me into high school. And this was my first high school, American Senior High, right there in Hialeah, Florida, if you ever go and drive by. It's in a moderately good neighborhood down the street from my original elementary school. And so it had a mixed audience, if you will. The expectations for the underrepresented students, who were the majority, Latino and African American, and they were not seen to be the top A students of South Florida. So when I decided to start to take 
advanced physics classes in the 10th grade and decided to bone up during the summer, I came to a quick realization of how many barriers really existed for me that did not exist according to everything that I had learned from my parents and other teachers before then. In my 10th grade summer year, between ninth and 10th grade, as I tried to get into this physics course, I discovered the thoughts and opinions of a new summer instructor. When I went in for the first day with my physics book clean and fresh in my hand, waiting for her to show, and sitting amongst the my peers who are all giggling and laughing because it's summer quarter, not sure what to expect, but not really interested in work, the woman came in through the door, she saw us, she had her book in her hand just like ours, she looked at us, looked all the way around the room at us, and then put the book down, loudly said, um, I don't even see why I'm gonna waste my time. And then left, <laughs> rotated and left right back out the door she came in. The whole room looked at each other and then busted out laughing, everybody but myself, because I wasn't about to waste my time. So in that moment, I had to then ask myself, was her opinion, enough for me to also join the revelry, just laugh and blow off a whole summer, waste my time? Or did I still want to understand all of the facts, all of the equations that existed within that book that was still in front of me and my chocolate little hands? So you know the decision that I made. That woman does not define me. She is just one teacher out of many. So I stood up, walked right back out the door that she went through and I didn't look for her. I had already made my decision of how she felt. No need to waste my time with that. I went next door to another teacher and let them know that we need to inform the principal, we need a new sub, we need to get taught. And from that point forward, they found someone who was willing to teach us and then it let me know, it let me sink in that the way that I see myself doesn't necessarily translate to other people. When you look at me and people who are like me, who come from my type of neighborhood, you cannot always assume how we were raised or what our foundations were based upon. When you look at me, you do not see Pemerson's Germany. When you look at me, you do not see Lieutenant Colonel's daughter. When you look at me, you don't see business education of the year for multiple years running the 1990s um, Mary Jane <laughs> Mann Pollard's daughter. You don't know that just on the surface. And so then I had to decide, how do I now feel about me? Well, you can pretty much guess. I'm surrounded by too much greatness. I have almost every single person in this photograph, except myself happen to be in that orange suit with the green shirt. That is like the only person in my mom who are not military leaders in this photo that you're looking at. When I woke up, my dad was giving me army chance of what we were going to do. Let's up, hands up, let's go. Put it together, deep voice, cadence, marching, clean those boots, make it shine, get my stuff together, where's my briefcase? And it wasn't like in uh, like a, a, a scary way or anything, but there was an expectation that you would rise up like a good little soldier, understanding the chain of command and that you are capable. That's what resonated within me. There is nothing lacking and how I felt about myself. So understand that just because other people see barriers and the barriers are real, how you feel about yourself and the decisions you make for yourself in spite of those barriers, that is the censure. That determines your story. You are the author of your story. Everyone else is just a character and you determine and can edit how big, how important a character or how minor a character they become. So I went back to my roots. I talked to my family and I decided I care more about getting deeper in physics than sitting here listening to just someone else's opinion. And that carried me all the way through undergraduate study, just like where you are right now. I want you to understand, once you get to that level, as you get to undergraduate level, the gulf between being a great physics undergraduate student all the way through that last day of senior year to your first year as a graduate student is huge. It's worth a little moment of silence. 
I want you to understand, no one really helps you have like a training day or a nice little six week pack, um, little session, a boot camp, a real boot camp to get you situated to feel confident enough to secure all the tasks you have to do as a graduate student. Because the gulf between the expectations of an undergrad and that of a grad student are so awesomely apart. But I want you to understand, there is help. There is hope. There is a way to get through that. Mentorship, just like it took all of my family members and comments and encouragement to get me through the major um, disparities that I had against me in high school and so forth. The same type of um, network of support is necessary for you to get through graduate school unscathed. You can get through it, but it can do so much damage to you unless you have that network of mentorship. So please understand that mentorship is life and it goes both ways. Don't just take, also be a mentor. I want you to understand that mentorship has been shown by research, real research, numbers, science, to prove that if you get adequate mentorship, this can help propel you to success and improve the likelihood of you graduating and successfully completing your coursework. When women have another peer woman mentor, someone higher, then you will start to see them not dropping out of the STEM majors. If you have just one mentor who represents your background, that can completely stop you from falling apart especially if you come from an underrepresented ethnic minority group, that teacher who also comes from that different background is necessary. You must look for mentors that represent you and see you as an equal. You want someone who doesn't see you as a challenge to figure out, but oh my gosh, as a, almost a, a memory of how they used to be. Someone who sees you eye to eye and gets you. Sometimes just with a head nod and it's like, oh, I get it. I see you. And literally understanding where you're coming from. Look for somebody like that. If you can't find them face to face because of the remote atmosphere that we're all working in, now the whole world is open to you. There's a plethora of physicists of various backgrounds for you to reach out to who would be more than willing, especially now if they're researchers, to lend a hand. And I don't want you to think that this is all just for, um, just for the undergraduates and the graduate students, that only those people need mentors. Even myself, as a faculty mentor, I need other people above me, other faculty to assist me in learning and developing the social network skills such that I can still move forward. It actually impacts the bottom line of how many publications you put out. As a faculty mentor, you must, or a faculty in period, you need to make sure that you are attached to someone who is just as invested in your um, welfare as you are and make sure to pay it forward and then give help to other people who are downstream of you. So if you notice the work that's been done, especially by people such as Dr. Holliday and others at my campus who are literally just across the hall from me, if you have a faculty mentor as a faculty member, you will publish twice as much just by virtue of that relationship that you have with them. Please understand there is scientific fact to prove that mentorship will change how you achieve different academic goals. So this was me when I was you. When I was just a, a wee undergraduate person, I was happy, I was greasy, I was full of excitement, ready to take on the goals of, of graduate study. And the school that I ended up taking some of my graduate, my um, undergraduate coursework was the School of Advanced Studies at, M, at Miami, Florida. And if you guys have ever heard of a dual enrollment program, please, if you haven't done it yourself, let your um, family members know. But this is what graduate school was like when I got there. I was not smiling all the time. I went to University of California, Los Angeles, but it was the time that I touched the pipetter for the first time. I got to have my own bench space, and actually you, there's tape, if you can actually zoom in and see, that indicates where my area is versus my next partner who's doing research alongside me, and I learned all of my basic laboratory science skills on the job. And it was almost a six year, you know, almost a six year endeavor for me. But I want you to know, 
I brought my parents every step of the way. Even though they were back in Miami, Florida, I flew them up and they came to visit me as often as I could. And even when I was doing flow cytometry work and so forth, the need to have that attachment to my family and to feel supported even when I was 3,000 miles away helped me to feel even more supported in that different environment. And you too. I want you to understand, keep those community ties, keep those familial ties that allow you to get back to your baseline of normalcy as you go through a number of different changes that graduate school puts you through. But if you end up going to a school like UCLA, let me tell you, it does have perks. I enjoyed getting to see all the different movie premieres. And this was back right before Brad and Angelina actually were officially announced together for the Mr. and Mrs. Smith premiere. So I want you to know, you can have fun, amazing fun that exists beyond just your research life. And I was standing alongside my other research partners. Get ready for the amazing best days of your life, where even as you're talking about the issues you're having in the lab, working out your experiment, having the difficulties back and forth with your PI, I want you to understand there is brilliance and beauty in the midst of the chaos that is constitutes grad school. I loved and hated it equally all the way along. And then there was this day. I, I want you to look at this face. This is almost like, uh, like a, 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 an African-American spiritual photo. That's how deep you can almost see my soul cry in this, in this picture. Because what just happened here, this is the culmination of after my committee came back after my dissertation defense and told me that I had just been uh, cleared for getting my doctoral degree. When you get that, you passed. When all five committee members say that and you are done, no more late nights working from 6 a.m. to 6 a.m. looking for these mice and whatever type of work you have to do for your project. That is a release that no man or woman can take from you. I want you to see, and I didn't get a ring at that time. I didn't get a big present or anything. But for me, and this is pre-baby, pre-husband, pre-everything, it was just Julie against the world. And I had my cohort of support from Miami backing me up and lifting me up and prayer and so forth. But at the end of the day, on that moment, when I was surrounded by my family who came to see and whoever could, it was that big release. So to me, this was my first best day of my life. There is a huge difference. I know graduation normally is great. High school was okay. Um, college, let me tell you, I don't wanna say you didn't miss much, but I will tell you, I don't remember it not too well. We walked across the stage, I had a big gown on. But your graduate degree, when you literally put in the work and your hands show it, your mind shows it, you have new wrinkles. When you earn that title, that is a different feeling. And I want you to know that day is coming for you too. This is your day. You will earn it. No one can take it from you. No one can say affirmative action or something else gave it to you. This is your day. Your whole committee will know. Everyone who was in the room will know. And now because it'll most likely be done virtually, you'll have videotape too. So that will be even more awesome. Uh, so get ready for that. And it's so good that even though you may have had ultimate horrendous fights with your mentor and colleagues and so forth, because that's what happens. That's the nature of the relationship. It's almost like a marriage, you and your PI, regardless of the gender dynamics. And um, you will find a way to get that project completed to their satisfaction. And then you'll cut cake like you are um, bride and groom <laughs> and be happy with one another, despite all the things you went through because you grew together. And so did that project. You develop a new dimension of who you are, a new depth of character. It is so awesome. And then you have that other graduation where all of a sudden you look just like Brad Conrad. Yes, you do. I wish you had put on his little view again. You get that cap and gown and it's big. You look like you're in the Supreme Court. Yes, it is amazing how big the regalia gets. 
And that party, ladies and gents, lets you know that you will never have another questioning night of can I finish this project? Will I solve this issue? That moment can never be taken away. But it's a, it's a cooler, a chiller, more tranquil um, excitement. And then you get to meet with your deans and your chancellors and so forth, and they commend you for all the efforts that you went through in order for you to get to get to that particular point in time. And that celebration of scholarship, true scholarship, is the most incredible feeling. But then guess what? That's not it. It keeps getting better. If you decide to join me in the ranks of medical physics, guess what you get to do? You get to take part in projects that will allow you to work with physicists and oncologists from all over the world and help to implement changes in how we treat cancer patients. And specifically in this particular photo, I'm the beautiful little person over here in the black and white. It's coming up with ideas of how to treat um, people in low to mid-income countries with cheaper versions of radiotherapy units and how to actually expedite the expansion of radiation oncology centers in areas that are devoid of even one LINAC for up to almost a million people. So when you get to meet with like people from the UN, all focused on one effort that you are also focused on within the United States. That takes it to a whole new level. That actually allows your PhD to be utilized for a much bigger purpose than you thought regarding your very narrow project that constitutes your dissertation. And from that, you actually get to go on site. Yes, I actually got to go to Marrakesh and see camels, ride them, meet the people, understand with the doctors on the ground exactly what the concerns are and what the units would actually have to be like and to develop business plans and modes of operation and workflows that are dependent upon what we do here at MD Anderson and translate that to their particular service area. But even in the midst of that, even as you see this, you get to see and have fun and learn from a variety of different sources and just live your best life. So this was a good day too. And so something that kept me going always at the back of my mind, no matter where I was, whether I was in Germany, Marrakesh, Houston, Miami, I refuse to be anything but successful. It's a mindset. You're not always going to be right. You will fail at times. That, that's life. But at the end of the day, after you fail, dust yourself off, learn from it, it's a choice, and then try again differently. So having that determination, I'm not just gonna say grit, because that word gets used so much now and, and almost puts the pressure on the person that's been marginalized to just accept any hardship that comes your way and just suffer through it. No, I don't want you to suffer. If something is not for you, you have tried multiple different ways, it does not bring you personal joy, it serves you no purpose, go away from it. Go do something else. I give you that permission. It's not failure if you don't complete something that you no longer want to do. If it no longer suits your needs as an individual and you have other options, make use of them. I want you to understand that being in academia, that choice that I made with being in medical physics has been the best choice of my life. Having trainees, and this was my very first trainee, I could not believe the feeling of actually telling another individual all that I know to help her grow and to becoming the best medical physicist that she can be. I want you to understand that everything you have inside of you and the goals that you have for yourself, there are career choices within physics at large that can support them. And that even if you don't know a specific choice of type of flavor of physicist that you want to be, there are ways of being a narrowly defined physicist that you can still incorporate all of the outreach, all of the mentorship, all of the wonderful things that you want to do. Because if you look at my job title, does it say go to Africa every couple of years? Does it say go ahead and give outreach talks to people? Does it say to go ahead and try to inspire the lives of other undergraduates who you will never meet in person? No, I choose to do this on my own time. So you can always make your life as big as you want. Don't let the narrow confines of the job that you go for define who and what you are capable of doing fully. Because anything you do, you can make it expansion. 
And then I started to be able to bring students on campus, of course, pre-COVID here at MD Anderson, where we hadn't had large scale high school outreach events that through our center, I was able to help to get that started and had the biggest joy of my life every single year, uh, probably except for this year, of course, we have brought over 50 or 100 students onto our campuses so they can be inspired by all of the oncologists and tour our center and then become the next generation of biomedical sciences, scientists and researchers. And then, of course, always remember who you come from and the promises that you have to keep. At this moment in time, I lack both parents, but I want you to understand everything they ever instilled in me is living just as strong and powerfully as when they were breathing. This will always stay with you. And I want you to understand there will be a day where you're just going to have to go back on memory of what your, um, what your mentors and your parents and your family members have taught you, but it will be just as strong. And that is what helps propel you forward. That fire in your belly, that's what's gonna keep you going, even when you come across a difficult road. And I want you to understand, you always have the choice to change your mind about things. So when it comes to these tips, I'm gonna repeat it one more time because I want you to let it sink in. You must know your story just like I told my story. What made you choose physics? Why? What about yourself says that you are a physicist? You need to answer that now before graduate school or your next job as a physicist tries to tell you different. I want you to know for yourself so that when doubt creeps in, so that when a barrier creeps in, so that when another employee or student outshines you and makes you look like the dumb one in a room, that you don't forget. Answer this question for yourself, who am I? And write your story. Next, please, I don't care if you're a woman, a man, non-binary, whatever, be selfish about your well-being. The people that you surround yourself with in your life can hold you back or push you forward towards your goals. If there are people that are restraining you based upon societal pressures for what your gender or whatever should do, meaning i.e. children, marriage, all this other stuff, all these nonsensical things that are in complete obstruction with your goals for yourself as an individual, you must take that time to say stop and then decide for yourself what are your goals for every aspect of who you are. If you notice that you feel overwhelmed, stressed, tired, especially right now, you need to take ownership of that and pull back and find yourself in a situation that allows you to be at your best completely. I want you to, before you engage in graduate school or your first job, to know what brings you peace, what brings you tranquility, what allows you to excel, and what kind of people do you need to be around in order to feel at your best, and choose that. Don't let anyone bring down your shine willfully, okay? I need you to understand what it takes for you to get back in a good state, and then hold on to that, and maintain habits that keep you at a good state. Be a mentor, help somebody, find somebody even who's on the same level as you who needs to know something that you know and tell them and help them and encourage them. Then go and get yourself someone who is not just a mentor, but look at that word that I wrote, an advocate, someone whose job is to look out for opportunities for you even when you're not present, who will bring up your name even when you're not in the discussion. That's the kind of mentor you need, not just someone who thinks you're great, but someone who will act on it even when you don't ask. I have those kind of people. They help you jump light years ahead. So find an advocate, someone who will put their neck out on the line, put their reputation on the line to say you should have this job over someone else, even when you didn't even ask for it. And then use these kinds of people, these types of mentors, these kinds of advocates to write your letters of recommendation. I get too many students' letters of recommendation from other faculty that is subpar, that does them no good. If possible, always ask the writer if you can see a version of that letter before they send it and close it and send it off. You need to know what's coming out about you. I know that there are people who feel sort of weary about that and so forth, but if all is good, they shouldn't mind letting you know what they're about to write. Because most people, even if it's negative, will just tell you, I can't really write something nice about you. I don't know you that well. And then don't use them. Find good people. Fail forward. 
or at least differently. Don't keep failing the same way twice. That's called research. You'll learn. Don't worry. Grad school will teach you. But make sure that it's not a pretty much an all or nothing feel for you. Like if it's not a success, then everything is over. No, you fail, you learn, you grow. Everything that happens to you is a learning experience. Make use of it. Speak up for yourself. In the sciences, and especially like within medicine and healthcare and so forth, lots of us come from very different ethnic backgrounds and have names that are not traditional to the speakers who exist in the, um, in the areas that you may be. So if you have a name that people are just trampling over and you just decide to start calling yourself Sue, no, just call me Matt, call me A, it's okay. No, don't let these microaggressions grow. You deserve to be recognized. So say your name, make it clear to others. I want you, even if it's like your graduation day, enunciate how we should say your name. Spell it out, but don't reduce yourself, minimize yourself to be acceptable and palatable for others. I want you to own the name that has been given to you and respond to it. What you accept, people will do. So decide what matters to you and what name you want to be known for. Speak up for yourself. Make sure that you do have some sense of a backbone and pride for yourself and just don't get trampled or used um, you know, at will. Have a growth mindset. Do not believe that everyone is skilled and talented at birth and there's nothing that can be added to you. And so you are always stuck at this level of ability. Everyone can grow and learn. You're not an old dog. You can learn a new trick. And I want you to feel that way about yourself. To that end, start to do things that you suck at now and get used to what failure feels like because that's gonna happen in grad school. Start to do things that are outside your norm, that doesn't um, involve embarrassment or large people seeing you fail at it. And then keep working on it until you see the improvement in yourself, whether it's running, track, whatever, bike, biking, an exercise routine, something where it's minimal risk, but it shows you that you are capable. And I need you to feel that way about every aspect of your life. And then finally, like is not a requirement. Most people will not like you. Most people are just indifferent. So even when people don't respond the way you expect, I want you to understand most of the time, you're not on their mind. They're not thinking about you one way or the other. So don't get your feelings hurt. Um, I'm not gonna use the politically charged term that ends in flake. I want you to understand that not just to have thicker skin. I want you to have a bigger appreciation for how um, busy everyone is. You don't have to like everyone for them to work with you. I work alongside people, and I shouldn't say this too loudly because they're down the hall, that I just don't like, period. I don't. And they don't like me. And we have a mutual agreement. We nod and we, we laugh. <laughs> I don't like you. That's right. We don't. But we respect one another's talent and ability for the roles that we've been given. And we treat each other with that designated respect when we are in person and in private. That is a guarantee. You must have that. They must call you by name and title and so forth. But I don't have to like someone to learn from them. I can learn from the devil. I'll learn what not to do. So I need you to have that kind of mindset of accepting all of the different things you can learn from all of your different experiences because it will help to shape you. But then remember, you are the writer, the author, the editor of the story that is your life. And I want you to take the helm, take that pen from everyone, the pen, the keyboard, whatever little analogy you want to use, and you start writing like crazy. Know yourself. Be selfish, be a mentor, grab an advocate, fail forward or differently, speaking up for yourself, have a growth mindset. And remember, they don't have to like you, but they must, they must, and you must respect you and vice versa. All right. So those are my lessons that have helped me to get to where I am as an associate professor and to really enjoy and maximize the life that I have created for myself. So I thank you so much for your time. And then I'm going to open it up for them to switch out to the questions that you guys have. Here's my contact info. Thank you, Dr. Pollard Larkin. That was an amazing talk. <laughs> Um, we do have one question already. If anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A and we'll answer them. Um, we have one from Gary. What advice would you give someone who just finished a traditional physics major but wants to move toward a career in medical physics? Is it, is it, is it even possible? 
Oh my goodness, Gary, how are you? Congratulations, it is possible. You need to reach out to APM, find out what type of outreach um, fellowship programs that you can get into. I wish you had literally found me like two months ago because we are doing a virtual summer fellowship project right now for a group of almost 20 students right now. It's gonna be a 10 week project. We will have another opportunity obviously next, um, next year around the same time with a due date of about February uh, 2020. What I want you to do is you can email me. We can see who we can connect you with and also look for what type of um, APM resources are available for you to connect with other researchers who could do virtual projects with you and give you time to do something during this gap year. What I want you to pay attention to is going to the APM's website and looking up all the different programs that exist for medical physics that are accredited and determine the different requirements and the course load that you would have to take. See if you can start to take anything remotely now that can be used towards your graduate degree. Because I think you could work on probably finishing up maybe even four to five classes to help jumpstart either your master's or your PhD. But I want you to know we are ready for you. There is room for you. And there's a way to navigate this because especially now that so much is remote, you can get started right now. And thank you so much for wanting to join us. I am proud. Thank you, Gary, future med physicist. Um, can you explain what AAPM is? Oh, my bad. American Association of Physicists and Medicine. So the website would be aapm.org. And so if you go to that website, you'll learn everything that's necessary about what medical physicists um, do as a whole and all the different specialties. You'll understand what we do professionally and out otherwise. And it will also give you all the links that you need education wise to understand what type of fellowship opportunities exist, any type of scholarships, and then it'll give you connections to CAMPEP. C-A-M-P-E-P -E dot O-R-G, CAMPEP dot org, which oversees the accreditation of all of our medical physics graduate and residency programs. Because before you can practice within a clinic, if you want to become a therapy physicist, then you actually have to do a clinical residency just like the medical doctors. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, from Robert, we have, how does one get over stubbornly waiting for the perfect career and just start applying? You know what, Robert? Baby, I feel you. <laughs> You want the perfect one, but let's be real. We're all fighting against each other right now for whatever is left. Put your net out wide and then learn how to enjoy the power of my favorite word and my baby's favorite word, no. So put your name out. See what responds back to you. And we all need to do this. Be more aggressive to see what pops up and then start to compare the ones that say yes to you for the negatives and start to I'll use my first tip, knowing yourself and know what about yourself is not in alignment with the offers that you get given. All right, but please, it's okay not to wait any longer. See what pops up and even if it's just one, use it as a stepping stone to immediately jump out of to what you do want when it becomes available. But make sure at the very least, you um, make the most of whatever that opportunity is that you do end up with. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Mel. What advice would you give to a faculty member trying to promote medical physics as an option to biology students who is not a medical physicist? Now that's interesting. Pure biology students, I can understand um, some of their concern having to take the higher level physics courses and so forth. But what I think you must appeal to, because remember, biologists, they have a heart. <laughs> so what does medical physics have that the other physics specialties don't have? A heart. And I, I'm so sorry to say this because I understand there's some astrophysicists and pure physicists who are like, what? We have hearts. But we have an intimate relationship with the actual um, therapy of our patients. So we have this direct connection to helping save lives. If you connect to those biology students by first showing the impact of radiation therapy on cancer patients, the closeness that a medical physicist gets to have with the patient as they do special procedures, brachytherapy, and so forth and then to see how that relationship grows. And then at the very end, you get to see the treatment plan that's utilized. So you have an appreciation of both the science and that beautiful touch. That will change their point of view. That's what bridges our gap between medicine and physics. That's how we came about. So for a biologist, it's not that far leap. I think it's a bigger leap for a pure physics student to all of a sudden want to be around patients and having to talk to doctors and, you know, be more social and whatnot. But a biology student, they've never seen the softer side of physics. 
you can show them that. <laughs> um, I think we have time for one more. So from okay. Courtney, what was your process in finding a good mentor for graduate school? I am in the process of looking right now, uh, looking for the right school mentor and program. Any advice for that process? Thank you. Your advice and life experience was amazing to hear. Oh my God, say her name again. Courtney. Courtney, Courtney, my heart goes out to you because uh, let me just be honest. I started out with a mentor I loved and I was so excited when I left Miami and was like, I'm never going back. I can't wait, going to LA, got my mentor. I was so happy. And then there's a very funny thing that happens with mentors. It starts with an F, next letter is U, but it ends in N-D-I-N-G. Funding, yes, that's the real F word. <laughs> I want you to understand that. This is the only word you care about. <laughs> so you can love your mentor all you want, but what I suggest, because it happened to me, I ended up with three, <laughs> okay? I ended up for one lab that lost money, then another lab. I want you to understand, I was around the era of like uh, 2008 and all that, so yeah, it happens, you know? And we're again in that kind of situation. You can't always predict the financial dynamics of a department. Things may change, but what you can anticipate is the whole collection, the diversity of projects available within that institution. Make sure that when you choose a mentor, there's also some co-mentors and other people that I like that project. Like the, what they're working on, that, that specialty makes sense to me. I wouldn't mind working on that. Make sure that they have at least three or four other people that are like, hmm, I went completely slight right, but you know what? That's not a swipe left. Make sure that happens for you. Don't just pick one, pick a group. I want you to find out what place has the highest potential to bring satisfaction to you if you had to jump ship and go to another project. But ultimately, just decide the flavor of the project and find the place with the most people working on that kind of thing. Then I want you to look at their profiles. Look at the people listed on their papers. Does it reflect who's on their lab website? C, are you going to be included? Understand what the diversity is. Does it include, um, you know, a, a wide range? Do you see like you would fit there? I want you to get a sense of their culture, how they interact as a group. As a, that's, a, that's totally different than what's going on in the institution as a whole. So I want you to be smart because this will become your family for five years. This is not an easy decision. It's like picking a spouse. Cause I mean, most marriages don't last five years. Let's be real. So you have to be more sure about them than your boyfriend or girlfriend. This is hard. So make that choice of um, mentor as serious as you can and be real about yourself as to how much scope you wanna open up your mindset to so that a project is acceptable. And then also see how many grants has this person gotten and received over time. You can ask for that. That's not, I mean, it's sort of a personal question. It's like, ask me how much I weigh right now. I won't tell you, but I will tell you, well, I'm well fed. And they should be able to say I'm well financed. They should be able to say, I have this many NIH grants right now that I can just write you in with a supplement. They know that I have this NCI grant that has this amount of money left on it, this many years are left on it. Get that kind of information through your negotiation and through your, um, your interviews just to see like, where do you stand and do you anticipate you know, having issues before I even get past my uh, second year comps? Like you need to know this before you're going from door to door looking for a mentor. And I can tell you that is the worst. No one likes the little beggar girl asking for a project. Uh, so, but people will accept you because you know they have to. But the thing is find a place that has as many great PIs as you can and then just be happy with what you get to focus on in the end because every project can grow and be adapted to what you're good at as it proceeds forward. Awesome. I think we are going to move on, but thank you so much, Dr. Paula Larkin. That was an amazing talk. Um, virtual applauses for you. <laughs> Aw, thank you guys. I appreciate every minute of it. Take care and be safe. Thank you. Um, and for our next part of our talk, we actually put together a little presentation um, of photos that you guys sent in to us um, and with quotes from Sigma Pi Sigma and SPS alumni. Uh, if your quote wasn't featured, we had to cut a little short, but we will be sharing everything else on social media. So please enjoy.
thank you all for joining us today. We just wanted to say congratulations from SPS National. Brad, if you wanted to. <laughs> no, that was awesome. So thank you for an amazing talk. Thank you for showing up. Um, we really wish you the best and we'll always be here. SPS is always a home for you. So if you want to touch base or interact or contribute, just drop us a line. So on behalf of SPS National, the Executive Committee, and the National Council, and everyone at the American Institute of Physics, congratulations. So cheers to you.